I'm just going to bring us back by switching gears a little bit from some of the work that we were discussing this morning and saying a few words about the work of the BC Civil Liberties Association on the national security portfolio. The association has been at the forefront of virtually every important national security file and development since 9-11. We made formal submissions, of course, on Canada's anti-terrorism legislation. We called for the public inquiries into Canadians rendered to torture. We've intervened in the constitutional challenge to the security certificates regime and brought litigation in our own right with our partners at Amnesty International on matters of Canada's complicity in torture of Afghan detainees. In addition to national security work per se, issues of national security have inflected almost every aspect of civil liberties in Canada right now. From purported national security privilege increasingly being invoked to bar citizens, journalists, and even parliamentarians from vital access to information, Privacy rights, of course, in every imaginable sphere are subject to the rebalancing exercise uh, of privileging national security that has ushered in everything from naked body scanners to no-fly lists. The criminalization of dissent and protest witnessed the largest mass arrests in Canadian history at the G20 with approximately 1,100 people illegally arrested, searched, and denied counsel. We've, of course, seen the intensification of racial and religious profiling and dragnet surveillance in the name of intelligence-led policing. The militarization of our domestic policing forces is another ramification of this. Secret evidence and profound repealing of due process rights adds to the long fallout um, of the 9-11 legacy. And it is curiously unrelenting that these various rebalancing exercises are meant to be permanent, can actually be denied by no one at this point. Um, Canada, outside of any parliamentary process whatsoever, has made a secret agreement with the United States to vastly increase the amount of personal information of Canadians that flows to the US and harmonizes our national security approaches in a huge array of arenas, ranging again from no-fly lists to cybersecurity and biosecurity. Now, almost none of the details of the perimeter security agreement are currently available to Canadians or indeed to our elected officials. Experience would suggest that the harmonization process is infinitely more likely to Americanize our national security than it is to Canadianize theirs. We are already dangerously far down the road of allowing a foreign government to dictate which Canadian citizens are allowed to fly on airplanes. In addition to being arguably the most vocal opponents of Canada's adoption of no-fly regimes, the BC Civil Liberties Association is also active on these matters in the international arena. Um, Carmen Chung, who is our acting litigation director currently, authored our report on the UN Security Council's 1267 regime and the rule of law in Canada. My Carol Merrill moment once again, the report available on our website freely online. Now under the 1267 regime, sanctions are imposed um, without or rather with minimal due process protections. Only one Canadian has ever been on the United Nations consolidated list of individuals and entities who are subject to these sanctions that include international travel bans and asset freezes. Under this regime, there is no recourse to judicial review, no access to the full reasons for why you have been placed on this list, and no right to know the identity of the state seeking to have you so listed. The association launched, launched a constitutional challenge to Canada's adoption of the 1267 regime, along with our co-litigant, the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group. The BCCLA has had a long and productive relationship with the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group, 
So it is particularly fitting, I suggest, that our guest speaker on civil liberties and national securities is the co-chair of the ICLMG. Maureen Webb is a labor, human rights, and constitutional lawyer who is a dauntless advocate for civil liberties, particularly in the national security context. She has written the indispensable book, Illusions of Security, Global Surveillance and Democracy in the Post-9-11 World, and has been involved in the Arar Inquiry and national security cases at the Supreme Court of Canada. Thus, we are delighted that she is joining us to talk about civil liberties and Canada's state of exception. Please join me in welcoming Maureen Webb. Well, thank you. We're here to celebrate BCCLA's golden anniversary. And founded in 1962, it's one of the oldest civil liberties organizations in Canada, the oldest, I'm told, and certainly one of the most active. And it has a stellar record of collaboration with other groups. And as Michael noted, that's how I came to know BCCLA. Um, I, I, through my work with ICLMG, um, I'm actually no longer co-chair, but um, uh, we've had some really wonderful collaboration uh, with your organization. And BCCLA has been a true leader in the country. Uh, it's been there where other groups have been absent or unable to be there. It's been in the courts, the media, always there as an ally, always dependable, resourceful, and smart. And I'm delighted to be here uh, and honored uh, today to speak here today. I was told that this weekend would be an occasion to reflect uh, as, a civil, uh, as a community concerned with civil liberties on the historic civil liberties um, challenges that we've had, and as well as emergent ones and future possibilities. And that really led me to think about what civil liberties are and what they mean in Canada in particular. One might say that civil liberties are a, essentially a fundamental set of individual, a, a, a set of fundamental individual rights, primarily political rights, that regulate the relationship between the individual and the state. But really, I think they're more than this. Civil liberties are an ethos that grow out of a specific culture. And um, so, for example, civil liberties in Canada are quite, they have quite different aspects than civil liberties in the United States. As, as you would know, um, they are, tend to be more communitarian, more evolutionary, less revolutionary. Uh, the right to property and to bear arms, for example, are not part of our civil liberties lexicon though our ethos flows from the common font of the English common law tradition. And within Canada, there are variations in the civil liber liberties ethos as well, I think. Um, the tradition of the BCCLA, I would argue, exemplifies a uniquely Western Canadian ethos. Um, and perhaps it's the, the individualism of the frontier ethic or, or just the fact that you're not as connected to the metropolis, you care less um, uh, about the um, central Canadian politics, that it makes it easier for BCCLA to take some really bold stances on issues, uh, such as the early stance that you took on the, uh, the uh, transfer by the Canadian military of Afghan detainees to uh, a high risk of torture in Afghanistan. At the same time, the ethos of our colleagues um, who are uh, also close comrades of ICLMG, Les Ligues des Droits, La Ligue des Droits et Libertés in Quebec, uh, grew out of a very different um, cultural tradition. Um, the, it came out of the, cult, the, the quiet revolution in Quebec and the vision of a new socialist and egalitarian society there, which they are currently engaged in defending with students on the streets of Montreal. So there is, I think, a rich and uh, distinct tradition of civil liberties in Canada that has informed both our struggles uh, over the course of our history um, and our victories, and uh, has done so in the past decade in particular. And the past decade, with its war on terrorism, has been a decade of special challenge for civil liberties. Each of you, I'm sure, has a story 
to tell of the, uh, the day um, and the place uh, you found yourself in uh, when the Twin Towers came down uh, at the World Trade Center. You might have known somebody at the towers, you might have been on a plane. Uh, I myself happened to be in New York at the time and, and saw the towers come down. And here in Canada, and particularly in BC, many of us might have even more searing memories of the, uh, the day when uh, the Air India flight um, went down with 166 Canadians aboard it. When violence threatens a democratic constitutional society, the reaction is visceral. And it's in this high emotional state that the society must determine what is to be done. The extent to which it can defend itself without losing the very attributes that define it. There's a very interesting um, American academic uh, whose name is Oren Gross, who, uh, to whom I owe much of my thinking about emergency laws. And he's noted that this dilemma is, uh, uh, really has tragic dimensions. You know, and if you think of tragedy as uh, uh, being about uh, a character flaw that uh, brings the protagonist inexorably to ruin, um, you know, the democratic society needs to be flexible, swift, and decisive enough to stave off the threat, but at the same time not transform itself into its antithesis, an authoritarian regime. And it has to answer the very fraught question, to what extent can we sacrifice constitutional democratic values in order to save the democratic constitutional order itself? The rule of law, which is the bedrock of constitutional democratic societies, is defined by principles of generality, transparency, stability of legal norms, and the universality of uh, individual rights. Whereas violent emergencies seem to challenge these tenets directly since they call for particularity, executive decision, secrecy, swiftness, and broad discretionary power. In other words, a state of exception to the normal, peaceful, legal, and political order. And over the course of history, societies um, have developed various models for invoking a state of exception to deal with extraordinary threats. In ancient Rome, um, there was, any of you that are uh, interested in, in ancient history, might be familiar with this, there was an institution um, of a temporary dictatorship which was built into the constitutional structure of the Republic. And it separated those who declared the emergency from those who exercised the dictatorial powers. Uh, in France, um, there was the concept of a state of siege. In the British common law, there has been the um, concept of martial law. And in human rights, uh, international human rights, as many of you would know, there is the idea of a temporary derogation from specified rights, such as the prohibition on uh, arbitrary detention, in times of public emergency, um, which can be invoked where uh, the crisis threatens the life of the nation, um, all of which are, are fairly uh, high thresholds to meet. Uh, now, I don't have time to describe each of these models, of course, uh, today, but the key to each is that the state of exception is invoked to meet an existential threat. It's provisional, it's temporary in nature, and it's premised on the eventual return to normality. And in Republican Rome, the term of the dictator's office was limited to six months, extremely short time. Um, and that was one of the keys to the successes of that particular institution. So the crucial concept in the models that, um, that have been um, less unfortunate over history um, is that there is a, a, a really defined separation between the exception and the normal. Now, a darker, more extreme version of um, state ex a state of exception is the so-called so constitutional dictatorship model of Carl Schmitt, who was one of the uh, uh, most prominent legal scholars to give his um, support to the Nazi regime in the 1930s. And in his model, the exception was really the norm. 
uh, since it was the leader who both exercised the exceptional powers and who decided when they could be invoked. And since they could be invoked at any time on any basis, Schmidt's constitutional dictatorship really wasn't a, a legal theory at all, but rather a veil of legality for, pure po um, for what is pure power politics. Um, but of course, as we know, a veil of legality is often exactly what those aspiring to authoritarian powers um, value. And I, and I found it really interesting um, reading a book recently that was written in the 1930s, contemporaneous with the Nazi regime, um, said that the common nickname for Adolf Hitler at the time during his rise to power was Adolf Legalité, since he um, seemed to put so much stock into um, being seen to win power through legal means. And we see a similar elaborate maintenance of the veil of legality in Bush administration doctrines, such as the unlawful enemy combatant, um, which really has no basis at all in uh, international humanitarian law. So that's a brief description of the continuum of state of exception um, co conceptual models. Um, and they, you, you can see that they, the, the continuum goes really from a, a very limited derogation in international human rights law to the extreme where the exception is the norm and you have a, uh, an almost complete executive dictatorship and only the veneer of legality. I would not argue, even as a civil libertarian, that exceptional powers are never justified or that any invocation of extraordinary power amounts to Carl Schmitt's constitutional dictatorship. It's possible, even for a civil libertarian like Pierre Trudeau, uh, to invoke a state of exception when faced with escalating violent acts on domestic soil. And in the FLQ crisis of 1970, he invoked the War Measures Act, rightly or wrongly, to meet the threat of um, continued bombings um, escalating into kidnappings and assassinations by Quebec separatists. However, I think that the lesson that uh, history teaches us is the extreme danger of the exception swallowing the normal. Whatever society's intentions are when it first invokes uh, the exception, and the lesson is that one must scrupulously assess the necessity uh, for invoking a state of ex exception, scrupulously assess whether we are in fact facing an existential threat and, um, and whether the ordinary law cannot really meet the challenges that we face. Because the separation of the exception from the norm is extremely hard to maintain. Once invoked, uh, emergency powers tend to take on a life of their own. They, um, the temporary becomes permanent, they function creep, they intensify, they multiply, much as uh, Michael has described, and ultimately, they change the political culture itself. And we see this across jurisdictions and historical periods. There's a remarkable similarity in how it happens. In, in ancient Rome, <clears throat> the mechanism of a temporary dictatorship that was tightly controlled during the Republic and maintained strict temporal rights worked very well until the practice began, began to change and um, uh, it degenerated over time into pure permanent dictatorship. In Ireland, uh, of course, there were counterterrorism laws uh, passed um, during the Troubles and the idea was that these were supposed to be operate as a separate regime and they existed alongside the criminal law for a time until they began to pervade it. And if, just as an example, there was a provision in the, um, one of the anti-terrorism uh, pieces of legislation that allowed police to arrest uh, people on mere suspicion and hold them for 48 hours for interrogation, something like the preventative arrest uh, uh, provision in the Canadian Anti-Terrorism Act. And of course, um, it had been passed as legislation to be used only in, in national security um, type crimes. Uh, but soon police were asking that it be used in all for all serious crimes and began using it routinely um, against what one uh, Irish commentator um, uh, charmingly put it, uh, ordinary decent criminals. 
Um, and when the new Criminal Justice Act was passed in 1984, it, inc it incorporated this provision. And the um, legislative uh, documents uh, gave the rationale that this was merely an implementation of the situation that had developed on the ground. In Israel, there was um, a law and administration ordinance of 1948 which gave authorities to issue um, emergency regulations. And it was used with a fair amount of restraint for, for 25 years until the 1973 Yom Kippur War when it began to radically function creep. Um, and it was then used repeatedly to settle labor disputes. And authorities became very addicted uh, to using it um, to, uh, as a way to bypass collective bargaining, uh, which for any of you that are BC teachers or with the BC labor movement, um, there's a cautionary tale perhaps. Um, I'm gonna see if I can move this up a bit because I would rather stand straight. <laughs> That, that's fine, thanks. That's great. Um, and in the US, oh, is that best? Yeah, it's best. Oh, okay. Thanks. All right, thanks. In the US, um, we, we see examples of emergency legislation that have both become permanent and have intensified and multiplied. There's been two reauthorizations of the USA Patriot Act um, in 2005 and 2006 with numerous additions made and trying to follow the layers of enactment and amendment and reenactment, believe me, it's a full-time career in itself. Um, and despite promises of reform, things have actually intensified under the Obama administration. Obama himself recently authorized controversial, um, he reauthorized controversial surveillance provisions that had sunset um, clauses on them under the Patriot Act. Uh, the NSA domestic spying, which if you recall caused such a scandal when it was revealed um, that the Bush administration um, was doing this secretly under um, 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 John Ashcroft, um, was actually put on a firmer legal uh, footing by Obama. And by the way, the NSA collects 1.7 billion emails, phone calls, and other communications every day and uh, sorts these into 70 databases. Many of uh, these communications are domestic American communications, and you can bet that many of them are Canadian too, since Canadian, um, a lot of telecommunications or, or networks are routed through the major routing systems in the United States. Despite the president's executive order to close Guantanamo Bay, the um, prison remains open, detainees remain there uh, without charge or trial, the flawed military commissions are still operating, and just last year Obama signed the National Defense Authorization Act confirming the military's power to detain people indefinitely and without charge anywhere in the world, um, unconnected to a battlefield as is required under the, uh, the law of war. The act also restricts the transfer of detainees who are cleared of wrongdoing um, to other countries, making the closure of Guantanamo Bay even more difficult. And the Obama administration has retained its authorization, its authority to conduct rendition, extraordinary rendition, and even the um, notorious uh, assassination program of the Bush administration. This has actually increased over the Obama years, and in 2010, the New York Times reported that the Obama administration had authorized that program to assassinate an American citizen. Hi. <laughs> I think I'm being upstaged. Um, having, having been in the theater before, I, I know what upstaged is. It's when somebody is behind you talking. Um, these tendencies to become permanent, to function creep, to intensify and multiply can all be seen to some extent in Canada uh, with our anti-terrorism measures. And, uh, you know, just take the Canadian Anti-Terrorism Act itself. When it was passed by the Liberals in 2001, it contained a three-year review clause and two provisions, uh, preventative arrest and investigative de uh, detention, which were subject to uh, sunset provisions. Um, they were supposed to expire within five years. Like the Patriot Act, 
uh, the Anti-Terrorism Act um, was reviewed and there were no rollbacks uh, came out of that. Unlike the Patriot Act, the sunset clauses uh, were actually allowed to expire, expire in 2007, but this was really only because of that odd thing we have in Canada uh, that they don't have in the two-party system in the United States, a, min a minority government. Um, and the Conservatives, who are now in majority, have reintroduced them. So this legislation, this emergency legislation, is now permanent. The Anti-Terrorism Act in Canada was supposed to enact a separate terrorist regime, um, but when we examine its impact, one sees that it's not separate from the normal order at all. Uh, it profoundly affects our evidence regime, our privacy regime, immigration, policing, freedom of information, criminal law regimes. And I've written a whole article on this, and, and Michael has described some of it to you um, uh, this afternoon. Take the effect of the Anti-Terrorism Act on the criminal Canadian law, uh, Canadian criminal law alone. Uh, with the idea of terrorist of terrorism offences, it introduces a new motive element into criminal law, which is foreign to the concepts that um, that uh, make that law work, um, and potentially politicizes the criminal code. The offences of material support pile incohate offenses on top of incohate offenses. Some of you are probably criminal lawyers here. For those of you that aren't, um, those are the aiding and abetting type offenses. And you can aid and abet to aid and abet under the new um, provisions of the um, criminal code brought in by the Anti-Terrorism Act. So this changes culpability in complex ways uh, and unforeseeable ways. Basic principles such as um, the fact that um, a, uh, a citizen has no uh, obligation to assist the police are undermined with uh, things like the investigative hearings. Uh, reasonable grounds um, of suspicion are subverted uh, with um, mechanisms like preventative detention. And in fact, the ATA is the counterpart of the US Patriot Act. Assassination programs aside, Almost every major counterterrorism initiative in the US, from the Patriot Act to the push for biometric ID cards and DNA banks, um, to the no-fly list, the NSA domestic spying, data mining, lawful access, border controls, all of these have their counterpart in Canada. And as Michael said, we are currently setting up an interoperable, integrated North American security perimeter with the US. So what does that say about a civil liberties ethos in Canada? We face some of the very uh, state of exception dangers that other societies face, and yet we have entered into this state, I believe, in a relatively unthinking manner. We've not had, and we're not having, the kind of soul-searching, society-wide debates that other societies have had. Uh, and, and I'll come back to this theme in a moment. Part of the myth of separation um, is this idea that draconian laws will be used only against a discrete, targeted group, a them or an other and not against the rest of the population and us. To take a historical example, um, this quickly breaks down. Uh, the brutal counterterrorism measures the French used against colonized Arab population in Algeria were eventually used on French soil against French citizens. And there's many aspects of Canada's anti-terrorism measures that will be used against Canadians who are not uh, members of the usual suspect groups, not un, uh, unfortunate enough to be part of Canada's Muslim minority. Um, and this, I'm talking about things, not just legislation like the Anti-Terrorism Act and the Public Safety Act, but the myriad of surveillance measures that have been implemented to create an infrastructure of almost continuous mass surveillance. Um, and this was the subject of the book that I wrote that Michael uh, kindly referred to. These measures give governments unprecedented social control. 
and they've also been extremely costly to implement. And so governments will not be giving up these uh, infrastructures anytime soon. They will have long-term and insidious effects on all of our lives. Carl Schmidt said that the state of exception tended to clarify or expose the power relationships in a society in drawing the line between friend and foe and setting up the, the most dire consequences of that delineation. And this is a very interesting observation, and I think it's one that, that leads to some interesting observations um, about Canada. How far we will go in a crisis. Um, and, and I think that, that the answer to that has a lot to do with, um, as I flagged earlier, our relationship with the United States, but also with the fluctuating uh, way in which we draw racial lines here. There's an anecdote that, that shortly after the Air India crash, um, Pre Prime Minister Mulroney called the Indian Prime Minister to give him his condolences. Um, and obviously, there was a perception in his mind uh, that the victims were not us, but some other group. There were no changes to our legal and political regimes as a consequence of the Air India crash, or as an immediate consequence. By contrast with the 9-11 events, um, it seems that there's been great clarity on the part of successive Canadian governments that we'd better be counted among the United States' friends. I don't believe that Canadians really, really think that terrorism constitutes uh, an existential threat to us, but we have pretty much towed the line on the demands the United States have made uh, on us for an integrated security space. But there have been a few notable exceptions. And here I think the story of Mayor Arar and Monia Mazig uh, is important. It's a uniquely Canadian story. They very early on broke down this uh, division between an us and a them. And subsequently, I think that Canadians and Canadian institutions have repeatedly rejected this easy yet false dichotomy in a way that, that one really can't imagine happening in the United States. Now, I think it was had a lot to do with their particular uh, personal charisma, their persistence, and the obvious integrity that, uh, uh, of, of both of them. Um, it, it broke down the idea of an us and them, and we could see ourselves in them. As a result, we were subsequently much more willing to go out on a limb for others whom we, we might automatically otherwise have treated as another. And this Arar factor, I think, has been uh, instrumental in many of the victories that we've had in Canada um, since, you know, from the beginning with the successful call uh, for the public inquiry in, into uh, his case, um, into the, uh, with the subsequent um, public inquiry that we won uh, with the Yakabuchi inquiry into the cases of other Canadians who had been detained abroad in the repatriation of Abdul Razak, uh, of Fuziam Abdul Razak and his delisting from the UN um, uh, terrorist list, in the series of security certificate cases, and finally in the Afghan detainees case, all of which took attraction in Canada that I cannot imagine they would have in the United States. This Arara factor and the leadership, I will say, of BCCLA which was always one of the first organizations on, on these files, put litigation and other resources into each and took a bold, fearless, and articulate stance on all of them. These were all human interest stories, but there are signs that Canada, Canadians are beginning to push back on broader, more, more um, technocratic policy issues. And if... Uh, um, the vigorous resistance to the recent lawful access legislation um, is uh, uh, a trend for the future. Uh, we can all feel heartened. Canadians quickly saw that this complex piece of uh, legislation buried within uh, an omnibus bill, omnibus bill um, was going to be potentially directed at them and their internet, and they got cracking and made themselves heard. <clears throat> 
Now, I said at the outset that emergency powers have a way of taking on a life of their own. The temporary becomes permanent, they function creep, they intensify, they multiply, and ultimately, they change the political culture itself. And there, there was a saying um, in ancient Rome that Augustus prepared the Romans for Tiberius. Uh, certainly, emergency powers augment the powers of the executive branch at the expense of other branches uh, of government. And in a democratic society, that would be the legislative and the judicial branch. And we've seen this clearly in the United States with um, the executive orders of the president. Um, we see in the political process more arbitrary, unreviewable power, more secrecy, and more end runs around the other um, um, branches of government. And in Canada, this has also been true. Um, although a, a lot of it has happened in more uh, insidious and hidden ways. And I, I would say that one of the um, most favorite techniques um, for the Canadian executive branch has been to effect uh, their policies through unaccountable international forums. Um, one organization is called this policy laundering, where you point to the International Civil Aviation Organization or the G8, uh, uh, and you say, well, you know, we have to be a member of, uh, of the modern um, Western community of nations, and uh, they're telling us we have to implement these new no-fly lists or whatever, whatever the... Uh, the counterterrorism measure is. And a lot of it has been pushed through around Parliament, outside of Parliament, in this way. Um, and it's also being pushed through um, unaccountable, really off the radar, mul multilateral and bilateral working groups, uh, such as the US Canada Smart Border Action Plan uh, groups and the ones that are currently setting up the um, North American Security Perimeter. One of the most telling phenomena of uh, the, um, the change in political culture is that of the frozen scandal. And that is where you, know, you have these successive re revelations of wrongdoing. There is much hand-wringing and debate about what has been done. And yet things do not change simply because there is no political or, or, or uh, will on the part of institutions or of citizens to actually affect change. In the United States, the scandal of torture uh, with the, um, the revelation of the Abu Ghraib um, photographs uh, was a, a wonderful example of frozen scandal. And uh, it, you know, torture is a fundamental prohibition. It's a, it's a fundamental tenet of all civilized societies. And yet, uh, when push came to shove, the Obama administration has made a, uh, a an actual decision that it will not investigate or prosecute high-level officials. Um, Canada has its own frozen scandal on the subject of torture. We had the revelation of CSIS agents interrogating Omar Khadr in Guantanamo while the U.S. tortured him, the revelation that Canada was complicit with the renditions to torture in the Arar and other cases, the revelation in the Arar inquiry that the Canadian ambassador was actually the go-between uh, between the police torturing Arar and the Canadian RCMP, um, and uh, the revelation of the Canadian military transferring Afghan detainees to a high risk of torture. The Arar inquiry re recommended that Canada do everything possible to avoid further complicity in torture, and these recommendations have not been implemented. And the Conservative government, in fact, has given a directive, uh, two directives to CSIS, um, instructing them that they may use torture, uh, uh, evidence that, that may well have been obtained by torture from foreign intelligence agencies, and they may share Canadian intelligence uh, with uh, those kinds of agencies. And it's worthwhile for civil society to take a good look at ourselves, too, when we talk about a change in, in uh, political culture. Um, uh, over the last decade, how long it took us to uh, call out and object to the treatment of Omar Khadr and to recognize him as a child soldier who was being held illegally in Guantanamo Bay and to call for his repat repatri repatriation. So to conclude, there are many difficulties 
in defending civil liberties in times like these. And uh, in the question period, there, there might be more time for me to, um, to expound on that. The challenges are daunting, but there is opportunity too. What do civil liberties mean in Canada? I think this is a time for us to debate and define who we are as a country. There is a future possibility that through struggle, we will come to a more mature sense of ourselves and develop a deeper, more fully, uh, fully worked out, more deliberate, more indigenous ethos of civil liberties. One can look across the victories of the last decade to see how far we've come in this story. And certainly BCCLA will continue to be a critical actor as the narrative unfolds. Thank you very much. Do you want to stay up here and argue the questions? Thank you so very much. The mic is available for anybody who has a question right here. Thank you so much for your book. I'm really excited to read it. Um, I wanted to draw on two things you mentioned. And one is that as a society, we have an ethos of democracy, an ethos of civil rights, uh, and this idea that we have a nation that respects the International Charter of Human Rights, that we have our own charter. And in the previous uh, speaker, we noted the case of Ashley Smith, 15-year-old, and you just spoke about Omar Khadr, and I wonder if you could talk about the relationship these two cases had, both children, both experiencing cases of torture. Um, you know, what's it gonna take for us to transform our legal system? Because effectively, I see it as a product of ourselves, a product of our society, so if we created it, we can certainly transform it. Well, um, I, I am puzzled why it, it it took so long um, for it to dawn on Canadians that that Omar Khadr was a child, um, and that he ought not to be treated as a, as an adult would, you know, regardless of whether he was innocent or guilty of what they accused him of. Um, and I I, I I really I don't know the answer to that. I I think that there is. Um, Certainly around the Catter case, there was what people call the Catter effect, where you know it was one case in which there was a pretty good evidence that the family, um, parts of the family were involved in terrorism. And perhaps on the part of civil society, people were reluctant to speak out because they were fighting so hard to... Um, have a credible voice on so many other critical issues that they did not want to be tainted or dismissed for having been associated with a um, with a, with a family that 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 for which there were reasonable grounds to believe that they they had been involved in terrorism. Um, but uh, you know that's a good question, and you know perhaps you could speak more to the uh, to the Ashley Smith case that 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 you just raised. <laughs> I was only raising it because on one hand, I do see that the system is biased, and racially biased, gender mm -hmm. biased. Mm -hmm. um, the case of Ashley was actually um, the speaker from uh, Elizabeth Fry who mentioned it. And oh, she was the, the young woman who was put yes. into solitary confinement. That's right. and, yes, yeah. Yeah, uh, um, well, you know, the, uh, Canadian prisons can be brutal, brutal places, um, and there's a desensitization that, that occurs, uh, and, you know, certainly that is part of, of racism in our society, where we are desensitized to the fates of groups that are not like ourselves, um, either because they're racialized or... Or, or, or different from us for other reasons. So, I'd like to. I, I don't know whether this is brought up this morning. I came in just half an hour ago, but uh, 
You might have mentioned that. They might have been brought up this morning. With civil liberties, you're against police brutality. Yes. Some police will take advantage of it. Give them a uniform, unofficial uh, uh, permission to beat people up. Well, the two cases happened back in England a few years ago. There's one fella and his sidekick. They got somebody in the marketplace. They beat him up, kicked him in the face. It was a three, it was a five pound, it was an eighteen pound fine paid off at three pound a week, publicity fee. Picture of him in the paper. Okay, uh, about two years later, he attacked the old boy at the dance hall. He wouldn't let him in. My cousin was on the police force. He went down to the, to arrest him. He starts soft mouthing off to my cousin about his sexual habits and his parentage. In all the words I mean, they took him down to the police station and gave him a damn good beating. And my cousin's not a thug. Wasn't a good thought, but don't you think cases like that they deserve it? And also, you remember the program uh, that, that, that the Con people that are beaten deserve Pardon? it. That the people who are beaten by that the people who are beaten yeah does by the police deserve what they get. Yeah, they, uh, and also, and they remember the TV program uh, disorderly conduct. Some of the police are heavy-handed here, but look at the way some of the people attack the police. Don't you think you know? There's some cases. It's, it's asked for police brutality. Well, police certainly have a difficult job. I, 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 mean, I heard David Eby on uh, CBC uh, just the other morning, and um, you know, speaking about the um, the, the recent case of the, uh, the the young man who had a, a mental disorder and had been shot several times and killed by the police. Um, you know, the police have a difficult job, but we don't expect perfection from them all the time, but what they must uphold is the law and the values of our society. And so, no, I, I certainly would not agree that people deserve the beatings that they get on the part of the police. Hi. Um, I'm wondering about language that our government is now using, such as uh, economic security. And I realize we do live in a corporate democracy now, and, and it's getting more uh, quite difficult for us to. Uh, but where do you for, where do you see this going? This whole idea of economic security, if we as 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 citizens are to stand up and say protest oil pipelines or otherwise, and they use this kind of language, this kind of bills that they're passing, and I'm just wondering where you see that heading. Well. Um you know, over the last 30 years, we've had uh, the um, supreme victory of neoliberal economic thinking over all other kinds of um, thinking about what should be valued in, in societies. Um, and one would think that with the financial crisis uh, of the last few years, that that, that um, doctrine had you know, been shown to be completely bankrupt, but it, it seems to have a great deal more force left in it. And, uh, um, you know, the, the, the short-sighted uh, um, um, priorities of government in, 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 you know, their environmental policy and their social policy uh, pointing to economic benefits that might even not be widely distributed. Um, is certainly a problem. Um, I I don't know. Uh... Well, of course, that's happening at the meta level, though, right? And and what's happening down below are you know the. Uh, Police techniques like kenneling and and the rest that we the, the kind of techniques that we saw in the G8 uh, the G8 summit, um, and and those are you know directly um, potentially charter challenges and, and civil liberties issues. Um, um, I mean, what I would say related to the what I spoke about today is that you know the political culture becomes more permissive for the use of more heavy-handed government tactics and social control um, on in other areas, you know, to advance 
economic agendas, for example, um, just the whole, the whole sea change that we've seen in the control of dissent since 9-11, where it's become common and accepted practice to create um, zones of, defense, of dissent where you know, dissenting groups cannot come anywhere near uh, you know, the, the, the object of their, um, of their dissent um, or are put off in, in parks that you know, are so far removed that their, their, uh, their protest has little effect. Um, the, um, the, the labeling of, of dissent as, as potentially te terrorist and you know the the excuse that that gives for greater surveillance of 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 people in in Europe a lot of these new border controls that have been enacted post 911 are used directly to stop um, anti-globalization protesters from moving from country to country or from you know mounting effective um, um, events um, and and so we we will see this you know look look at quebec look at the last uh, the legislation brought down by the um liberal government in response to the students um protest over higher tuition fees it's it's very heavy handed um and you know it it's this idea that security uh is paramount and uh and so it gives the state license to control a dissent and control populations um, in in ways that formerly were, were not not uh, widely tolerated. Um, so so yes, I mean I think there is the connection in that sense. Can I tag team on here and add something, Maureen? Mm -hmm. um, on this question of the securitization language everywhere, you will notice on the list for the perimeter security, um, biosecurity. What the hell is biosecurity? I hope everybody asked that when I said that word. I'll tell you what it is. It's the securitization and militarization of public health. Really making the draconian emergency provisions of public health much more the norm on trigger words like pandemic, which again, the executive will decide. Mm -hmm. So the securitization of almost every aspect of life, including health, through this new entity called biosecurity which, as I say, is really the militarization of public health. Um, so we're seeing that language economically in health just about in every um, fora that you could possibly imagine. Um, and it's not only tied to languaging, it's also tied to budgets. One of the things you find in international health um, arenas is you're going to have a very difficult time getting a budget unless you can fit yourself under the rubric of biosecurity. Right. So they're increasingly conflating naturally incurring infections with bioterrorism in order to get under the umbrella of where the funding is at. So I could unpack this for a long time, but thank you for mentioning language because mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's a really, really key component. I'm getting the signal we have time for one more question. Do we have a, there, right at the back. <laughs> I, can hold it. I was in Chicago in 1968, and of course, uh, Mayor Richard Daley had established a one mile perimeter around the Democratic National Convention, and so that was a few years before 9 11. But uh, playing uh, devil's advocate, advocate for a moment, uh, Maybe I don't have much talent for that, but maybe a bit. Uh, would you agree that there are protesting persons and protesting entities sometimes who have an agenda, and part of that agenda is to be so obstreperous and so annoying and so irritating that uh, at least one police car will get set on fire and so on and so forth? And uh, you know, a deliberate attempt as part of the agenda to be so in, in, insightful, inciting toward authority that they they almost have to react whether they want to or not. Uh, well, I, you know, I think a, a really effective movement um, has some control uh, or tries to exert some control over the um, the elements that that might uh, uh, want to um, be provocative and 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 uh, in a in a violent way. Um, but I do believe that, you know, 
police, policing, this is what policing is about. Policing is about keeping the peace and um, upholding the law. And there are techniques for police uh, to use to, to avoid the, you know, the, um, the incitement of, of stampedes and, and, and um, riots and, and, and all the rest without having to um, necessarily adopt militarized or, or uh, really extreme techniques. Um, and I think it's really healthy that, that police forces like Toronto, for example, are having conversations and, and um, they're questioning the use uh, at the uh, G8 summit of these more extreme techniques like kenneling, um, you know, uh, whether it's really the right thing to do. Um, and sure, there might be a fence torn down or a... Uh, or, or a, a police car set on fire um, occasionally in a, in a mass protest, uh, but um, often not overreacting is the best political move on the part of authorities. And again, I go back to what's happening in Quebec right now. If, if the charade government made one mistake, I think was it was to um, enact this draconian law which incited a larger section of society to, to, to go to the streets with the students. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think it comes down to, to technique and um, to tactics and there's smarter ones and less smart ones for, for authorities and demonstrators to, to follow.